Good afternoon and welcome to the National Urban League's Digital Career Success Series. I'm Jody Brockington, the host of today's show. We are bringing to you live here on Facebook, the infamous Don Marcel Collins. Um, today we are discussing the road less traveled. Not everyone is meant or believes to be a entrepreneur, to go out on their own. We live linear lives, going to school, going to college, and then getting a job, supposedly. But Dom is going to share his story about how he kind of broke free and kind of went on his road less traveled. I had the pleasure of meeting Dom actually never in person until today. I have been following him on Facebook as I Facebook and also LinkedIn. More LinkedIn because I was following your career because I felt like you really embody a lot of the folks that listen in to Digital Career Success Series. Those who are working hard day to day at a job that they may like, they may even love, but they have other passions. They have some side hustles, they're doing some other things. And I felt like Dom really embodied what all of you have done. You've done well at school, you've joined some organizations, you've even tried to you know, do something that you're more passionate about, but you haven't made that leap. And I have Dom here today to tell us how he made that leap, what finally pushed him, to the edge to go on his own, um, and also share what he learned from being in a regular job in finance, doing well, um, and going to some of the top schools, joining some organizations that really helped his career. So um, today, Don's going to answer a bunch of questions, not just from me, but also from you, the audience. So just make sure that you decide what you want to really know from him that I don't touch upon and also what you can learn. So take notes and join in our conversation. Don? All right, let's get it. <laughs> <laughs> let's get it. So you had a good time coming down here today. You've had a tour of the National Urban League's headquarters here in New York. Yeah, it was very nice. The Not so bad? I love the red and white. Okay. Or red and cream. Okay. Do you have a kappa under under no, that? No. Okay, just wondering. About his kappa. Okay. <laughs> well, Dom actually comes from or born in Puerto Rico, ailed and then moved from from in a military family life to New Orleans, Louisiana, and now has landed himself in New York by being brilliant and smart. So, from all the places that you've moved around, do you think that also? from your lifestyle, your being in a military family, also allowed you to kind of get on this road less travel? You know what, that's a good question. I think um, just moving into different places allowed me to be very um, flexible and getting acclimated to different, different cultures, um, different weather, um, being around different people. Because when you are an entrepreneur, Senior entrepreneur, <laughs> you really have to be very flexible. There are going to be times where things are not going to go your way. There are going to be times where you're going to be people who try to steal your money. Steal your money. <laughs> right. But you also have to be able to read people well, be able right. to move read in and out. Right, read people well, um, move in and out. Like, exactly. So, yeah, so a lot being in different places definitely allowed me to see different things and just – be you know well versed in different cultures and how to speak different languages. I speak French as well. That's what I was gonna ask. So I will Un poquito español. Un poquito. Okay. Ah, thank you. <laughs> That's fine. But that can help in singing as well. I remember yeah. in high school I didn't sing in English until like my junior year. So you know the singing part. So what made you decide when you changed your brand um, to make your brand just your first and kind of middle name, dropping the columns. How did you decide to brand yourself now? Once you left the finance world, you try to drop a name like, oh, how does that happen? Well, Don Collins is my professional name. It's um, who I am as a professional um, in, the, in the corporate world or just me um, managing myself. Don Marcel is my brand, my artist name. And the reason why I came up with Don Marcel is that one, Dom, my first name is Dominique, but mm -hmm. everybody knows me as Dom. So, you know, all my friends and, you know, family, some of my family members call me Don. But I also really liked the name Marcel when I was growing up. I was like, I really like Marcel. Okay. So I was like, why not combine something that I'm really known for and something that I really like that's part of my name to create a brand for myself? So it kind of, it's kind of like 
allows people to, um, you know, to associate me with something that they are familiar with and also allows me to combine, you know, something that I really like as well. When I first reached out to you, I said that um, I felt like you had done everything right, you know, checked every list, every checklist that any parent would want you as their child, right? You went to the right schools, went to top schools, you joined the right organizations, you did well. Um, what made you decide finance originally? Was it just the money or was it something that was instilled in you from a class you took? Was it your major? What led you to finance in the first place? Well, finance is the uh, finance slash business. It's, it's, it's a building block for anything, for any industry. And I knew that um, going into school, um, and originally I wanted to be an entertainer, a singer. So okay. I, I always knew that. You're going to need some <laughs> I always knew I was definitely going to have, there was, even though I wanted to be a creative person, I knew that I had to maintain a duality of having that artistry and business so finance and business um go hand in hand and i knew that it's a it's a building block for any venture and in order for an artist to treat themselves as a business they have to be well versed in, in business um and that's what i've done right no <laughs> you, are you, you are also managing other people's money so you realize right. that you can manage your own but the thing is um what people sometimes don't understand is that as an artist, you are running an actual enterprise. It could be a small enterprise. It could be, you know, one or two man team. But you have to understand that you are the enterprise, and you have to create a business plan behind anything you do, because there has to be a market. There has to be some, some taste. You have to make sure that the financing behind it is going to be viable enough for you to sustain. You know monetization that's probably can never happen so you have to take all those things into consideration when you are being an artist so I knew that finance was actually going to it's actually interesting um coming back to your question I, I stumbled on being an investment banker mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I always knew that that was a because I didn't I didn't say I want to be an investment banker to be a singer. I knew that investment banker opens the door to lots of exit opportunities for you to actually go into industry to actually you know do corporate development to, to go into Silicon Valley. So the investment banking gives you the tools and the skill set to actually do those things. So. It was casting a wide net, so that's the reason for reason why I did the finance um, ultimately. Okay. So yeah. for some of you that are still thinking about, you know, career moves, still in employment, you know, the financial sector got a big hit, and I was in it during that big hit in 2008. You're probably still in school. Um, so you know, bringing sexy back to uh, finance, I think you did a good job. <laughs> But what would what did you do and did you do pursue any music stuff while you were in school as well? Like was that still kind of brewing? Were you in a a show? Were you part of some other entertainment stuff that also kind of kept you going in that space while you were so in school? It's kind of like so. To, I have to backtrack so the the audience can understand. So I have different chapters of my life. So the first chapter of my life is <laughs> University of Southern California. So that's the first Trojan. chapter. Trojan baby. Trojan. <laughs> So as a tro Trojan, as un an undergrad, I was a full-time student, but contemporaneous to me being a student, I was also a performer, okay? So I was performing at different shows, clubs in LA, Reggie Bush's Orange Bowl Party, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So I did all that stuff. Now, um, I also did internships at Atlantic Records, at HBO. That's what I mean. Right, exactly. So that's the first chapter. And that's part of what, um, while I was searching for you in LinkedIn, <laughs> kind of popped up. I went to USC, but for my master's. My yes. father worked at Home Box Office, was one of the first pioneers that started NAMIC, the National Association, of now Multiculturals and Communications, and it was National Association of Minorities in Cable at the time. 
So you were bringing back a lot of history for me, um, which is why I felt like your pathway and all the different things you did would definitely be interesting. So that's just phase one. Phase one. So, it, and the singing did not help. The, the singing <laughs> did not work for me. Okay. So I was approaching graduation and it was not happening. So I was like, okay, I need to go to corporate America. I need to make some money okay. because I was afraid and risk averse to graduate and be a full-time singer okay. with no money. Okay. So I decided to um, put it aside, put it aside. But when I was in corporate America, I still was, you know, delving into the creative side. You know, I sang in my church choir okay. and I did, you know, theater productions. So I, you know, to answer your question, I, you know, I was still that dibbling and dabbling before the second chapter, which was Northwestern University, which, where I got my JD MBA, my law degree, and my yeah. master's of business administration. Now, keep in mind, during those times, I would still was not thinking about being a singer, as, uh, being a full-time singer. I was only just doing those things, um, dibble and dabbling and, you know, productions and stuff like that, just to, you know, be happy as a hobby. Mm-hmm. It was just a hobby. It was your side. Thing. Right. Was yeah. Something made you happy, something you just wanted to do to fill in some time. Right. Some people play basketball and you were in the studio. Yeah. Okay. So I always <laughs> tell people, I always tell people that it's great to, to keep that creative juices flowing. Whatever passion you have, even if you're in corporate America, Make time for those passions because it, it you know, it allows you to maintain a healthy lifestyle psychologically. Uh, I think people tend to forget that it's just as important to, you know, maintain a, uh, you know, family and friends, but also to maintain your passion. Sure. Um, so, so, but when did you know then that music was? what you wanted to do. At what point did you make that shift? Right. Phase three, right? Phase three. <laughs> like when do we pivot and so, make right, that change? I'm going like this. Zip, 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 zip. Um so the last semester at Northwestern, um, I made the decision. Uh, I was not happy. So I had done a lot of internships. I did internship at the SEC. I did internship at at a bulk record investment bank. I did an internship at the attorney general's office. All those internships, I had actually got an offer to go back to my investment bank, which I eventually um, accepted as a media entertainment investment banker. But all those opportunities weren't giving me uh, the passion that others were having. And I started self-reflecting uh, because I just wasn't happy. I just didn't understand why I wasn't happy. I was like, why am I happy? I started to write down things that made me happy. And I was like, well, Don, you haven't sang in years because I will let people hear, some students in class, I will let people hear um, some of my songs back in the day. They're like, that's you? I was like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I was like, oh, why did you quit? And I didn't, I only told my fr- a couple friends that I used to sing because I didn't want to, it, it was a past life. Um, but then I was like, why not start writing again as a hobby? As a hobby and start getting back into it. So I started writing songs and it started resonating with people. So my last semester, it started resonating with a lot of people. And then um, I made the decision to do it full time when I was at my full time job um, because that's when things started to really pick up. And did, was your boss and other folks, were they supportive? Were you trying to keep it quiet? Like, you know, how were, were you like, oh, I'll do this at my lunch break? Or were you doing that and making trades? I mean, what, what was really going on here? <laughs> Well, on Saturdays, I record on Saturdays. Okay. Because it's hard to get cooking time. Yeah. So you work as an investment maker, you work Monday to Fridays and then on Sundays. 
on Saturdays, I was like, okay, I'll go to the studio and record. And do this. Yeah, it's like, it was kind of like my creative outlet and way for me to maintain a balance in life because I was working so many hours, so many hours. So um, that's how I kind of like manage my, my creative passion as well as my professional life. And so what is one major difference of now working for yourself versus when you worked for someone else? What's something you do differently? I can sleep whenever I want. <laughs> True. But do you sleep that much now that you work for yourself? No, you know what? I actually sleep sporadically now. Okay. The life of a true entrepreneur. All right. Small so um, sometimes I'm up early at 4 a.m. You know, yeah, my sleep is all over the place. Um, because sometimes I wake up, I'm like, oh, my God, I have this idea, and I have to write it down. And I start writing a song. Or I start Suddenly, thinking. It's three hours later, right? Right, right, right. So that's the creative side. Right, that's the creative side. And then the business side, oh, my God. So it's kind of like I'm managing two sides. I'm managing the creative side, where I am right now. I'm creating the visions behind the new videos that I'm shooting. I have to do the bookings. I have to, you know, um, do all that. So the that. bookings of the space, the bookings yeah, of whatever. Location scouting, talent, all that stuff. Um, and I'm also writing songs, finalizing my album. And then the business side, I'm also managing a team, my marketing team, my creative team, PR team. Okay choreographer team stuff like that so Can you bring them in at different times or are they always there just it's an ongoing thing okay yeah and I'm, <laughs> I'm a part of the team so i kind of like it's important for me and i i like to say that to anybody as an entrepreneur it's important to wear hats it's important to not just delegate but also be immersed okay. in every in, yes not just delegate <laughs> participate okay participate <laughs> Yes, you have to, because I mean, you're the brand, you're, but you also have to set an example. Set an example. Also, it allows you to appreciate what others do, because if you're not doing it yourself, you can't ask the right questions, you can't appreciate what they're doing, you can't bring as much value to the table. So I think it's important to grow as a professional as well as an artist, because Nowadays, everything is do-it-yourself across industries, not just music. Um, everything is do-it-yourself. You can find a lot of information online. Do the research. And the more that you can do yourself, the more knowledgeable and the more value you can add to the team. And then when you add value to the team, the team adds value to you, and then you create a, a unique symbiotic um, relationship. Correct. But you know, and then you talk about that's a hard, it's hard to balance sleep, <laughs> work, performing, right? Like you're multiple things and everyone might have a task or might have a, a role, but you do need to understand them all. But you mentioned before, though, the one I want to bring you back to, as you said, at one point you chose the finance route because you were risk, you want, you know, you didn't, you were risk adverse, right? You didn't want to really take that much risk. But now you've taken it. So we have a lot of listeners that always are kind of in your same space where they want to go out on their own. And then they're like, yeah, but this check is nice. Oh, I want to go out on my own. But, you know, oh, my God, can I do it as this? Can I do it as that? What was that final push for you? So because it's hard. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, right. too. So I know yeah, I don't get a check regularly. Right. All right. <laughs> So you come, you come to a crossroad. Do you want to be happy? Yeah. Or do you not want to be happy? Because money does not make you happy. It makes you comfortable. Can you say that again to our audience? Money <laughs> does not make you happy, honey. <laughs> money, honey, doesn't make you happy. So the happiness factor, Correct. your so self-satisfaction. The, the, your passion has to outweigh that paycheck okay. so much that you are so hungry to take that risk. And my passion and hunger was so potent that no paycheck at that point was going to make me stay. So that's how I knew 
because you weren't as happy as you were in the beginning. It's not that you didn't love the finance career when you were. I appreciate the business for what it is because I encourage anybody to go into investment banking because it is, like I said before, the strong foundation and there, the exit opportunities are amazing. But from a long term perspective, for me, it was not sustainable because I knew that I had different passions than others. Well, I'm a firm believer, and you can not you can agree with me or not, but I believe that there's a point in one's career where your passion and your paycheck can finally meet and bring you this happiness. But I do also believe along the way there'll be some more happy moments, maybe less money, right? And maybe more money moments, less happy, or happy and more money, right? So because I feel like that's the trifecta. That's the point where when you're able to make sustainable income and then some, and not just sustain, but thrive, not, you know, and then also do what you love, right? So that's that whole Oprah effect of if you're doing what you love, it's not work, et cetera, et cetera. So do you believe in that or where does that fall for you? So when it, when it intersects, mm -hmm. absolutely. I feel passion and paycheck definitely will come together. <laughs> I mean, I feel when you're passionate, when you have a passion for something and you're doing it for the right reasons, you're going to find a way to make that passion translate into a business mm -hmm. eventually. You may need help along the way. Maybe it may tr translate into something, a new business, or you're going to use that expertise that you learned from that business to something else and juxtapose that and still fulfill your passion in a way. Um, for instance, like if a person is a singer, wants to be a singer, but they didn't succeed at it, but they become a music teacher or a consultant for you know singers, something like that. Right, or a coach or something like yeah. that. It's kind of like you could parlay your expertise to something else. But as I stated before, I feel that passion and paycheck will eventually intersect if you're doing it the right way. If you're doing it the right way, if you're taking all the necessary steps, because you can't just be ah, I'm passion. Oh. But blind right. but blind and not take the necessary steps because you do still have to even if you have a passion, you have to say, okay, hey, I have to create a business plan. Okay, I need the financing. Who's going to be my client? Should I get equity? Should I get debt? Okay, you know, what's my marketing strategy? You know, all those steps that have to be taken. You can't just, you know, say I have a passion. Okay, somebody give me money. No, it still has to be a methodical type of approach to any type of entry into the market. Okay. And so, what were some of your steps? How did you, you know, take your leap of faith? And then get things going. Did it, you know, did you leave on Monday and start on Tuesday? Uh -huh. Did you take a break? You know, what what describe that because it's different for everyone. Right, yeah. So it's I mean, it's I'll just, tell you my story too. Right. <laughs> it it wasn't just a oh, okay, bye. Oh, right. yeah. Wasn't that simple? No. It's like when you are in the process of realizing your purpose, it's a gradual thing. You have to make sure that your eggs are in your, your ducks are in the row. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an overtime decision. It was a lot of, uh, okay, a lot of planning, um, a lot of, you know, just making sure that I had a quality product. And then also just making sure that um, my plan was in place. I, I received feedback. I was doing, you know, focus groups. I was doing. <laughs> you were working before you were working. Correct. As you said. The thing is, it's a long process before people even see anything. That was months and months and months of planning before you even heard a song. So, yes. Yeah, so it, it's a gradual process, is what I'm trying to say. For you. For me, it was a gradual process. And, and did I'm, you ever try to leave, like, think that you were leaving? Let's just say, you know, January and it ended up and then you're like, no, I need to I'm still have two more focus groups to go. Like, when did you give notice? How did that how how was it for your employer part as well? Not just for you, but when you were leaving the finance industry. If I was your boss, what did you just come in and drop a letter? Did you send me an email? I mean, did you discuss it with me? Did you know? Well, you know, I 
it was pretty simple. It's like, this is what it is. And the person in charge was supportive of what I had to do. So, Had to give your clients to other people. I mean, what's? I gave no. Yeah, I gave notice. Yeah, I think that's important to to give notice. Of course. No, I'm saying some people just like these days. More and more people are seem to be a little disgruntled with work, right? And so you know, there's there's what's official in your employee handbook that says based on whatever level you are in your job, we need two weeks, a month, two months. Not to say you have to give it, but right. just. I want, I, mean, I want other people to, to hear about what could or could right. not transpire. So we all have the drop the mic moment, and I want to be out. Um, I, would say, I would encourage people not to do that. To just hey, <laughs> see you, see you later. Even if you got a, a rec, like a, sign a deal, right? You know, do what you have to do to do it the right way. Because right now you're an employer. So if someone worked for you and they're not so happy, you don't want them just leaving you in the middle of a production or a show. Right, right. Or, so that's why I'm asking because what goes around comes around. I'm big on karma. Right, right. Um, you know, like you, I took a risk much earlier in my career to work on my own. Um, but it took me a while to get there and almost, I mean, it took my mother to write my resignation letter, my father to let me know that he was going to you know, allow me six months of rent and food and stuff um because i was passionate about what i was doing but i knew it was time to go because i was not getting the feedback and the stuff i needed right. so but you you were in a different situation where you actually really kind of liked what you were doing i just like me i loved but it was just the wrong environment i couldn't do everything i wanted in that space and i knew i was being not compensated 100 percent, but my plan was different than yours so that's why i'm saying everyone's plan um, when you're ready, there's a different ready. Part is when your back's against the wall. Part is just when you're like, I need to be happier, right? Um, and so now as the employer, what are some things that you look for in people that you hire? Besides the talent. So let's just tell you, know, right. okay. I, don't, I don't know if they're production or they're doing business, right. but just what kind of people are important? People who have a drive and a purpose um not just to get a quick paycheck it has to be more than that somebody who is looking to grow with me because we're both we're both in it together um so somebody who's looking long term who can see something long term somebody who believes in what i have and it's vice versa so it has to be a mutually type of belief in each other um, and when you have that, then you're, you feed off of each other. You feed off each other creatively. So that's what I always look for when I, when I speak to somebody. I always ask them, what is your goal? Where do you see yourself in a year? Where do you see yourself in two years? You see yourself dancing. You see yourself ultimately want to be, a, like, for instance, if I was talking to a dancer, do you want to be a choreographer? Do you want to be a creative director? Or, you know, and we, can, and I, we try to explore how we can both help each other. Now, if those interests don't align, then maybe it's not right for each other. You know what I'm saying? So it always has to be the interests have to align. So I always try to, I always try to dig deep into what a, per a person's goal is. Okay. And sometimes it's hard to tell because things change. Oh yeah, um, of course things will change. You know, I used there used to be the the lifers, right? This is an organization that we're sitting in here today, the National Urban League, and some people have been here for as long as you've been on Earth. And some people just arrived you know, a week ago and are new employees. And so your, your shop right now is small, and you hope that people will kind of be on the train, right? You're kind of in the startup mid-phase of your, of your business. Um, so in addition to how you choose people, have you, do you have mentors of any kind? I have. Um, I speak to my, my father. I would say my father is definitely my mentor. Um, and I kind of bounce ideas off of him mm -hmm. um, throughout, you know, throughout time. So, um, yeah, I would definitely say that. Yeah. And any from school, from work, outside of your family? Um, not at the moment. 
And no one, does anyone motivate you? Do any, there's other singers out there that you aspire to be like or that have a sound that you go for that, you know, men, when I say mentor, it's not like they're sitting there and you have to ask them questions. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, someone wants to be in television and be a commentator, they'll have a whole bunch of people to pull from, right? So are those, and that's, I don't mean an official look, they sit down with you every week, mentor. Mm -hmm but just people who inspire you to do what you do every day and keep you moving. Yeah, absolutely. I, there are a lot of artists who have created a whole enterprise behind their brand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the Jay-Z's, there are Justin Timberlake's, the uh, Beyonce's. So they have good, strong businesses. A huge enterprise. And I think that's so inspirational because they have great teams behind them. And, of course, they're the mastermind, masterminds behind their vision because they they sign <laughs> they sign the documents. So those who are able to parlay their artistry into you know different venture capital, you know, going to VC and stuff like that, I really am inspired by stuff like that because that's how I would like to approach the business. Mm -hmm. um, looking at from a bird's eye view because music is only just a small component of what I hope to accomplish. Um, music is a conduit for a lot of things that I hope to, to accomplish. And I hope to, you know, I study people, you know, artists and what they've done. And I hope to use that as kind of like the blueprint, but also take, put my own spin on, put my own spin on certain things. So definitely, I actually, you know, I definitely, definitely am inspired by stuff like that. And I don't know your, um, you know, snack or beverage of choice, but if you could sit down with someone uh, over a cup of coffee or a smoothie, um, that could help you professionally. You get an hour with this person. Who would you choose and why? Oh, that's a good question. An hour? Mm -hmm. um, I would choose... I would actually choose um, Jay-Z. Why? Because Jay Z, he like um, it's gone back. Great to choice, life. by the way. Yeah. There's no wrong answer here. Yeah, <laughs> it's just curious. Because he, he's he's done so much, and not just entertainment, but you know, going into different enterprises. And I would love to hear how he parlayed his, the music part into going to management, going into creating his record label, other brands. On um, going to BC mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I think what he's able to was he's able he's been able to do is hugely inspirational. You know, it's somebody from you know coming from humble beginnings that he's come from. I think that's even more more inspirational um, to even do that. So I would love to pick his brain and see how he's overcome his ob obstacles because I'm sure. A lot of people doubted him, and he's been able to overcome that doubt. So, you know, I can mirror some, some of probably some of the things he's he's dealt with to my life. So, I would learn. I would hope to to hear how he's dealt with certain things and kind of apply that to what I what I do and what I want to do going forward. That's a great. I mean, I think an hour with him, you could definitely learn a lot. I would tape it and everything. Uh -huh. um, and in that same vein, um, what is something that you're you're in? Like, so Jay Z came into the business at a much different time. You're coming into the music industry um, when a lot more things are digital. People have more access to things. The mixes, like you know, before you had to get a DJ. I was from, you know, I even had cassette tapes. You know, those things that don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you see in the future of music or where do you have to kind of, or anyone who's in music now, where are they going? Like, you know, we have parties now with headphones and no music, right? I'm listening to the DJ and I'm dancing with you. Like, so where, where are you trying to fit in now with your music? Um, as far as me with artists, other artists? Or no, like, you, in terms of the industry, where is it going? Like, oh, okay. you know, that had to also be part of the draw, oh, right? Yeah, so you know. every, like you're saying, everything is digital. So you have to create a very strong digital presence. So my approach to the business has been trying to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. So going to places where artists don't 
Look we go. Okay. Uh, you know, to give it away. Uh, e, different social media. Okay. LinkedIn. So like stuff like that. Um, I've been able to leverage LinkedIn, for instance, um, in a unique way. Um, also, you really just have to learn what, because now there's just uh, influx, a huge volume of content. A lot of people could just easily upload stuff online. Mm -hmm. So you really have to come up with a way to, to, to not only differentiate yourself, but to rise above the noise. Um, and that goes back to, you know, the, the, the foundation of business development, sales, understanding mm -hmm. your customer. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to, the thing is, I was in business development throughout my professional life before JD, the JDMBA. Okay. And the key thing you always have to remember that many people forget, you have to add value to your customer. You have to add value. Giving them a song is not really adding value. You have to combine that with something. A song in itself, the, the, the price of a song is nothing. Okay. But combining that with something, an experience or some advice or just something is going to set you apart. So from one of our questions from the audience, because I'm sure you're tired of mine, um, they want to know how do you get into the music industry these days? Is it who you know, what you know, or where you are? I don't know. My family. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, that's a good question. It, it's a com combination. Okay. It's a but combination. Is anything way heavier than the other? And getting in the music industry, that, that's a loaded question, because what is getting in the music industry? Well, it depends on what side, right? If you want to be the performer, if you want to do production, if I want to do... Because getting into the music industry, you can upload a song and you technically are in the music industry. But, but creating a career... Listen to it? Is that creating a career, networking is number one. Okay. You have to network. Um, use LinkedIn. Use LinkedIn because nowadays everything is online. Back in the day, you had to do a lot of digging or ask, you know, asking somebody for a handout. Now you can go directly to these people. Mm -hmm. You know, you network, you ne you, but you have to network effectively, strategically. Right. You know, Still with a plan. It, it goes back to what I said. You have to add value to the customer and the person you're networking with is kind of like your customer. How can you add value to the person you're networking with? So um, networking and two is um, you really have to hone your craft. You really have to, you could create a song and think it's amazing. Do other people think it's amazing? Because amazing is totally subjective. It's like anything else, clothes, mm -hmm. wine, shoes, you like them, someone else right, doesn't right. like them. So you have to get, go outside your circle, which is basically your friends and your family, because they're going to always, most of the time, say, oh, my God, it's good, girl. Or not. <laughs> All the time. But you need to go outside, go, get, get objective feedback from third parties. So just let them hear a song. Don't tell them it's you. Well, what if it's not the music part? Maybe if they want to be in the industry, music industry. On the other side. On the business side. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. Yeah. Just so on the business side. That's the music part. So just get it out there, just like as if you were pedaling back in the day, but digitally. Right? So business, if you want to be in the business side of the music industry, it's, it's, it's a simple approach. Networking strategically. Um, you have to network with the right people. And the, there's a lot of consolidation in the industry. So the, the opportunities are few and far between. So you have to come up with a way. To stand out, how can you? How, how how are you going to add value to the company? Do you have a an already um, list of potential artists that you already have you know mm -hmm. could bring to the table? Or if you're looking to do marketing, do you have any ingenious ways to market to new consumers? You have to constantly think outside the box because it's so competitive. It's uber competitive. So with any approach to 
if you're an artist, if you want to be a business professional, if you want to be a manager, if you want to be a band member, anything, you have to always, comes back to, to the foundational principle is add value to whoever audience you're trying to bring um, your services to. Okay, so that's when you kind of know what you want. Now what if you're passionate about something and it's not particularly your skill set? So as you were kind of saying, you kind of sang a little bit in college. It wasn't your career. You didn't make a career of it. You knew you were good. Um, so how does, in, in other industries, not just music, but other people are curious. I'm taking questions from our Facebook feed. Um, you know, how do you go after a break into a field that is new to you. You know, I know how to do it, you know, how to make a shift maybe on LinkedIn and start following some groups, but how do you make that leap to something different? You went from finance to music. Someone might want to go music to finance or, you know, marketing to engineering. Um, how, how would you suggest someone would do that? So you have to, um, well, I can tell you about how I made a shift to investment banking. It's just it's, it's very similar. If you're doing a career switch, you have to know what they're looking for. So you need to look on mm -hmm. job boards and see what they're looking for. Look at those most, skills. And most of the time, they're saying we want somebody with a graduate degree from a top five institution or top like something like that. It's always some requirements that they're looking for. Start with that, and then okay, how can I? How can I? If I don't have those skills. I don't have those degrees, how can I supplement that or how can I get those degrees or how can I overcome those obstacles? How can I, you know, maybe say my professional experience could supplement or even take away from the degree part and position it like we could. So some degrees, so. some skills, right? So Correct. And then do you recommend any volunteer stuff? I mean, you're in a bunch of professional groups and organizations. Yeah, and the, did that help you at all? Yeah, the volunteer aspect, it, it, uh, it really allows you to develop your leadership skills because at the end of the day, with any job organization, they want to see your leadership potential because they're not going to always have the answers right there. So they want somebody who can take initiatives. They want somebody who can find ingenious ways to come up with the answers to, to, to difficult questions. So that's definitely something to, to, to really think about. Okay. Our next question is, when do you think the best time is to make a shift in your career? Make that switch, try something new. When When's the best time? Uh, the best time is when you know deep inside. It's like, there's really no best time. That's like, a, that's a, I don't think there is a, a right answer to that. But the best time is when you know deep, deep inside. It's when you constantly think about because when I decided to make the switch is that I it consumed my thoughts. I woke <laughs> yes. up thinking about it. Woke up, went to bed thinking about it. Woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it. It kept consuming my thoughts that I could not concentrate. It really, I really couldn't concentrate. On, um, like it got to the point where I, it was hard to concentrate on my job. So when you have something that you want to do and it's just constantly it's on your mind, then you just have to go after it. You have to go after it because if you don't, then you're going to beat yourself up about it right. years down the line. And I also say it's when your side hustle is no longer on the side and it's really what you're hustling, right? right? Where you can't, it's like that's what you're thinking about all the time and it might relate to what you're doing and it might not, right? right. So sometimes you can side hustle, quote, unquote, a little longer because what you're doing and what you're passionate about kind of, meet and i also say sometimes try to go towards a job that will lead you to closer to your passion right so if you did want to switch from engineering to law school or to a law firm to then work in a law firm maybe what you're doing in you know your current job you can still do it but in a law firm change environment make sure it's something that you want to do right stick to the skill you know as you were saying the transferable stuff that you can take with you and really see if it's something you want to do also but be careful be careful because you need to read those, read those contracts because sometimes you can't work on something very similar to something that you're already working on in the industry. 
Oh, of course. Um, I'm, but I'm saying it's a side hustle, so it's not become a job. So, no, no, no. but I'm saying I'm agreeing you with want, you. Yeah, because you don't that. want the company to take on. Well, that's yeah. Well, that's special. But I'm saying, in other words, if you were doing something to get closer to it, you don't right. want to be working in a Starbucks if you're trying to work in a law firm and you can make the same money. You want to be an assistant in a law firm if you can make that leap. For you, maybe there could have been a transition where you work for Sony. But you know, or something else in between to make that leap. Yeah. So, how do you grow? You talk a lot about social media. How do you grow your social media? A lot of folks want to know, you know, how important that is in your career change, and also how how much you need to use it. Like, how how can it be a great tool? How do you grow it? Because that's part of the networking piece. And then, how do you use it? So, there's three parts, like your three phases. So you said, how do I? How did you? How did you know? What's your Suggestions on yeah, for anyone, not just you, but mm -hmm. how do, how do they grow their social media, uh -huh. and then how do you use it to change your career, okay. and then how did you do it? So like generics, or you can start with you and then go to generics. Okay. So generically, you have to be active on social media, and I actually my approach to social media has was kind of I kind of jumped up with the idea of. Um, using every platform to my advantage. And um, for instance, uh, I always say that you have to think outside the box and really tell a story and really try to speak to the reader. Um, know who the audience is. How and which platforms are you on? I'm on LinkedIn. Um, Dom Collins for LinkedIn and for the other platforms, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I feel like I feel like I'm plugging. Right yeah, now. no, but people want to know, and I found you there myself. So go ahead. And um, I'm on Don Marcel, D O M M A R C E L, Instagram, Facebook. But those are the platforms you're on. Those I didn't have to platforms. know your handles. Oh, okay. I was just asking what oh, okay. you're doing the plugging. <laughs> Let's well, not the plugging guys, <laughs> which is fine. Okay. Because uh, we do want you to find him. So Don Marcel. Sorry guys. I didn't so know. LinkedIn, Facebook. Instagram, and Twitter. Correct, four, four platforms. So, but at the end of the day, you have to know who the audience is and then create unique messaging behind, behind it. Um, do you use any CRM platforms? Do you, you know, do any analytics to find out who? I mean, yeah. you might think that every woman is listening to your music, but it could be men. Right, so you're speaking to women on your Twitter feed, but really most more men are listening to your yeah. To your lyrics, whatever is on them. So, like, how do you find that out without using any kind of tools? Well, actually, some of the tools, actually, um, Instagram, like all my social media tools, I pay for an analytics. So, I, so I know. Analytics. Yeah, you need some. See, so that's see. I mean, you know, you might not be using a whole CRM platform, but, right, but getting some analytics. Yeah, I'm getting stuff. some analytics behind what I'm doing. So, I definitely encourage you if you're gonna use social media, you really need to know who you reach. Is who the demographics are, um, because it's important. Because if you are just throwing something against the wall, like, you want right. to make sure that so it's not just to be out there. Right. You have to be out there with, like you said, with a brand, right. a purpose, and you strategy. Want to make sure that the audience is growing, the views are growing, the engagement is growing. Mm -hmm. So, um, would you find one platform to have been easier to grow than some of the others? Like if, if I was just starting today because I'm trying to make this shift or, you know, with my new brand or with something else, would you suggest one platform over another? Um, it depends on what you want to do. But for me, I really like LinkedIn because it kind of combines all of my passions into one and my skills into one. Because with certain platforms like Instagram and Facebook, you can't really tell stories the way I've been able to tell stories on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm a storyteller. I, I, I like to talk. So <laughs> I like to talk. So it's kind of like, and write articles. That's another key thing about LinkedIn. You can write articles, which is another way for you to, to reach new people. And that, for me, is hugely important um, for not only branding, but just um, allowing people to see who you are, to get to know who you really are. Because people will get to know who you are through your writing um, and how you present present yourself to the world. Instagram and Facebook, you know, it's it's, it's short messages, but people will see 
who you are through pictures, photos. And sometimes people can misinterpret a photo or something like that. So, you know, I, I think those platforms are fun. Those platforms are fun, but I think you need to, at least for me, I, I like to have a more encompass, encompassing social media presence so people can see different sides of me. Um, and that's what I've been able to, you know, or at least try to do with my, my social media. And so do you, um, people want to know if they need to hire someone to do that? Like, you know, is that someone you have on your team who really watches your social media for you? You might be posting and doing some of the writing, but is someone really doing that or is it something that someone can do on their own? I actually do it myself. Um, but if you need help, I would su definitely suggest you hiring somebody to do it. Um, but I, I, it comes back to what I said. I think you should at least try yourself because the spirit of do it yourself is very important because once you do it yourself, then you can ask the right questions if you want to hire a team to manage it. If you can't, if you're too busy to manage it, then right. at that point you can bring somebody in. But if it is completely new, you want someone to help you at least put a plan at together and right. show you how to do it, you can take it on. Right. But in the beginning stages, like you don't have a budget, you know, just posting something about, you know, Instagram is more photos and Facebook is more photos and you know, right. kind of short posts. And sort of start, on what it is. start getting, getting active and then if you need more help to get more reach, then I would say bring, bring somebody on. Yeah, because a lot of folks, like you were mentioning before, just really have small circles, their friends, their family. Mm -hmm. So how did you break out of that ring? Did you, you know, was it from a series of hashtags? Were you, was it who you followed? Yes. What, what's, what's your advice? So that's, a good, that's a great question. So Instagram is great for hashtags to, to allow you to, to reach new people. And I actually met a DJ in the UK who put, featured me on his playlist from a hashtag. So that's just an example of how you can just reach so many people Across around the, the world. world. Right. Around the world. Um, uh, I just lost my train of thought for the second thing I was going to say. But um, how did you say how you grow? Yeah. Oh, like so oh you professional grow. networks. Mm -hmm. So. For instance, I am in multiple professional networks, so I've been able to leverage that. Northwestern, University of Southern California, Northwestern right. Law School. People snooze on these alumni. <laughs> if you went to a college, you have to use those groups inside of LinkedIn, also on yes. Twitter, and also Facebook. I they see. will go far. The alums go thousands, longer. That's thousands and thousands <laughs> of people. Education affords you access to And even networks. jobs that you have left or co jobs, organizations. So I'm on the Merrill Lynch alumni, correct. so and so would like to add those to Yeah, job okay. organizations and stuff like that. So that's your foundation. That creates the foundation. And then start branching out to people who you have commonalities with, who may not be in your school mm -hmm. network, but people who have graduate degrees. That's like a whole new network. Mm -hmm. People who have JDs, people have MBAs, okay, right. like people always want to network with people which have similar degrees that they do, and then branching that off to my location or you know people in the same industry groups, stuff like that. So as many groups as possible that kind of can help you get out there. So exactly. for you, it was music, it was finance, it was you know your groups, right. and then for those of you in our audience, it's those groups that you're trying to be part of or currently part of that can actually. Take, you can take them with you to that next time. Right. So, yeah, so, and it takes, and the thing is, I would encourage anybody who's trying to um, build up a so social media presence, be patient. Be patient because it takes time. Don't look at, because the thing is, sometimes you will look at other people's profiles who have hundreds of thousands and be like, oh my God, I'm so far away. Mm -hmm. But it takes time. You have to have a strategy behind your social media plan. And actually, once you develop a strategy and start really executing upon it, then eventually you'll start seeing results. But it's a it's a it's a long game. Not a not don't don't think yeah, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah. And also don't worry so much about the numbers, worry about the strength of those connections. I'd rather have 10 people who follow me and do everything I say, they click on things, they come to my website than a million people and still only those 10 people are following you yeah. and doing what you say. So look at the power and the strength of your relationships. That's why the alumni groups and people who know you are great. 
um, you know, once you reach those uh, people on social media, how do you, you know, get that traffic to your site? And the stuff I was talking about, how do you get a ROI? How do you get a, a return on your time spent to get them to listen to your song, to maybe purchase your song in your case, but for other folks in their business, how do they kind of see some traction? So you have to tell a story behind every post that you do. Um, you don't want, never say, buy my product. Just don't take a sales approach to your, your post because it will be less likely for you to get clicks. You want to tell a story. You want to give a people, a, people a reason to click. Something that will resonate with the customer or a um, potential person to you, potential person, um, your audience. Uh, so behind every post, I would always say you need to um, be more thoughtful behind it. Um, if you have a product, if it's like a, if you're selling maybe a cake, a wedding cake. Pictures. Pictures and tell a little story behind the cake. Show someone's wedding or has it. Yeah, or even say like, what was the first time, like maybe ask a question, what was the first, your first wedding experience or tell a story behind it. and. You want to appeal to a person's psyche, a person's emotions, because people like to feed off of their emotions because if it resonates with them, then they'll be, it, it will strike something more within them to learn more about what you do versus like, buy my cake. That, that's. Right. Well, know. there's pictures on Instagram that really make you want to grab and eat whatever it is, even if you don't eat it. Even if it just looks good, right? right. It tastes, look like it's going to be good. So, so one last question, and you're not that old, but what would you tell your younger self? What's something that you know now that you didn't know when you took this leap of faith that maybe if you knew you might have done things differently? Um, I would say be very wary of people's intentions and to always be knowledgeable about what you're doing. Because people, I've learned that if you don't have knowledge, that is a seeding ground for opportunism, for people to take advantage of you. Okay, so one thing I definitely do appreciate right now that I do have and I didn't have as much is knowledge and experience um, and capital. <laughs> <laughs> knowledge, experience, and capital, that's a lot. <laughs> Three big differences that will make the world different because if you lack any of those, people will try to take advantage of you. And unfortunately, that's how the world is. But you don't want to be crushed by that. You just want to appreciate, you just want to understand or understand for it. So I would tell myself to read more books. Read more books. Be more knowledgeable. Um, because knowledge is power. It's cliche, but knowledge is power. The more knowledge that you have, the more you can communicate with somebody, then the more that you can stand your ground. So with any industry, with whatever you're trying to do, I think it's important to read trade publications, always get, always be up to date on what's going on in your industry uh, because you want to have that to, to really communicate well to a potential partner, investor, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think you have definitely wowed our audience. You uh, definitely have an interesting story as a storyteller, a musician. You've been around the world from not only youth till now, and I'm sure you're going to wow them some more. Um, and for everyone to be able to find you, what are some of your handles again? <laughs> uh, Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under at Don Marcel. D-O-M. D-O-M-M-A-R-C-E-L-L. And you can find me on LinkedIn as well under Dom Collins. And I'll give the plug 
as a third party that his music is really great. So if you have an opportunity to listen to a couple of songs, support him by at least giving some likes, um, find him across social media, and if he's performing somewhere or producing something, you know, we're here to bring you folks that are doing what you're trying to do, and we all need support. It's not just the dollar, it's also the fan, it's also someone else doing something for you. So thank you for joining us today on behalf of the National Urban League and myself. But before I lose all of you guys, I just wanted to uh, remind you that we have in March coming up, uh, Women Who Thrive at Work, and we are bringing someone from the C-suite, and I will not divulge her name yet, um, but it's Where Women Thrive at Work, and it will be coming up in March, and it'll be here, um, it'll be a webinar instead of Facebook Live on March 7th, uh, still 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, hearing from our leaders in the C-suite um, is very important because not only have they made it to a top chart in corporate America, but all of them have had stories of side hustles and other things that they're passionate about that they also want to share, but also want to share how you can thrive where you are in work, not just as a woman. So I do encourage men to listen as well. It is the year of a woman but we are trying very hard to make sure we have a balance. And so we will see you March 7th here at the National Urban League DCSS Live, brought to you by the Urban League Jobs Network. Dom, honestly, wish you only the best. I can hope to continue to follow you across social media and in person. And I hope today, those of you who were you know, fortunate enough to listen in to our Digital Career Success Series, really learn something and listen to it again. We will repost, um, it'll be refurbished. It will also, we'll be giving Dom a, you know, a, a copy of it. So it'll be on his social media and hopefully then we'll reach more folks. So thanks again for joining us. I hope you had a great time today. You. Sharing your story live is hard sometimes, um, but he has a great story and I'm sure you do too. So please, if you have any other questions, send them in. And we'll see you next time, March 7th. Thanks again for coming.